Hello everyone, my name is Lauren Reynolds. Welcome to the Politismos Museum of Greek History online lecture series which brings the museum experience into your home. With a 21st century online format, Politismos is proud to give visitors the chance to explore Greek history and culture from the comfort of their computer, tablet, and even their smartphone. For this lecture, you'll be learning from author Timothy Sandifer, Vice President for Litigation at the Goldwater Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. He served 15 years as a litigator at the Pacific Legal Foundation, is the author of four influential books, and has written over 45 scholarly articles. The topics of his writing include eminent domain, copyright, slavery and the Civil War, political issues in Shakespeare, and even Star Trek. Here is America's Founding Fathers and the Greeks, Part 2, The Greek Frame, by Timothy Sandifer. In my previous talk, I said that America's Founding Fathers modeled themselves more on the Romans than on the Greeks. There were several reasons for this, including the fact that in their day, much of ancient Greek literature was still undiscovered or unavailable in English translation. Also, the British Empire enjoyed the pretension of following in the footsteps of Rome. But another important reason was that for the American founders, ancient Greece stood more as a warning than as a model. While Greek philosophy was a basic framework for the founders' political thinking, Greek political writings were of less importance to America's founders than were the writings of Romans like Cicero or Tacitus. Thomas Jefferson explained why in an 1816 letter in which he essentially brushed aside Aristotle's politics as largely irrelevant to the American Constitution. This may seem surprising given that Jefferson elsewhere cited Aristotle as one of the four most important political thinkers for the American revolutionaries, the others being Cicero and the Englishman John Locke and Algernon Sidney. But Jefferson explained that the style of society in ancient Greece was so different from what it is now and with us that I think little edification can be obtained from their writings on the subject of government. They had a just idea of the value of personal liberty, but none at all of the structure of government best calculated to preserve it. They knew no medium between a democracy and an abandonment of themselves to an aristocracy or to a tyranny independent of the people. It seems not to have occurred that where the citizens cannot meet to tra transact their business in person, they alone have the right to choose the agents who shall transact it, and that in this way, a republican or popular government of the second grade of purity may be ex extended over any extent of country. The full experiment of a government democratical but representative was and still is reserved for the Americans to try. In other words, the principle of elected representation was a revolution in political thinking. There were elements of it in the British parliamentary system, although the House of Lords was still an aristocratic body, and the House of Commons was so badly apportioned that it wasn't really representative. And there were elements of it in the Roman Senate, which, however, was not elected at all. But a government in which the people chose representatives to deliberate over political business and be responsible to the voters had never been tried on anything like the scale of the American Constitution. Indeed, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, the earliest appearance of the word responsibility was in the Federalist, written in 1788 by James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay. This concept of representation, however, turned on a deeper distinction between the Greek and the Roman legacies, and that was the principle of the rule of law. The history of the Greek city-states was a history of turbulence and warfare. And those city-states were themselves either tyrannies like Sparta or direct democracies like Athens. Tyranny and democracy are both Greek words and both have essentially the same connotations. Lawless rule in which the citizens enjoy no protections against the government. Had every Athenian citizen been a Socrates, wrote James Madison in the Federalist, every Athenian assembly would still have been a mob. True, we find a basic conception of the rule of law in the writings of thinkers like Aristotle, but the history of ancient Greece, and particularly of Athens, showed that these principles were more often betrayed than honored. Rome stood for the principle of law as opposed to democracy. The Roman ideal was a society in which everyone was bound by reasonable, comprehensible rules, rather than being subject to the shifting and unpredictable will of the majority. 
The historian Polybius, writing during the Roman Republic, thought the history of the Greek city-states revealed a six-step cycle. This begins with despotism. But when the people can no longer stand being ruled by a despot, a few brave leaders rise to overthrow their oppressors. These leaders then become an aristocracy, but their children grow up in luxury and excess and are prone to avarice and unscrupulous love of money, to drinking and debaucheries. So they abuse their power until the citizens finally overthrow them. And being still in terror of the injustice to which this led before, the people now don't dare to trust any new ruler. So they take the power into their own hands. And this is democracy. But democracy can only last a generation or two because as soon as the democracy has descended to their children's children, long association weakens their value for equality and freedom, and some seek to become more powerful than ordinary citizens. And the most liable to this temptation are the rich. So when they begin to become fond of office and themselves unable to obtain it by their own unassisted efforts and their own merits, they ruin their estates while enticing and corrupting the common people. When in their senseless mania for reputation, they made the populace greedy to receive bribes, the virtue of democracy is destroyed and it is transformed into a government of violence and the strong hand. For the mob, habituated to feed at the expense of rulers and have its hopes of a livelihood in the property of its neighbors, as soon as it has got a leader sufficiently ambitious and daring, produces a reign of mere violence, and then come tumultuous assemblies, massacres, banishments, redivisions of land, until after losing all trace of civilization, it has once more found a master and a despot. This warning was well-founded. Consider the history of just one city, Athens. In 508 BC, Cleisthenes established the foundation of what we call the Athenian democracy by dividing up the traditional tribal alliances into a modernized voting system. Eighteen years later came the glorious victory over the Persians, and shortly thereafter the Greeks formed the Delian League, pledging their alliance against the Greeks. Only 18 years later, the Peloponnesian Wars began, which lasted until 445, during which time Pericles and the other aristocrats exercised virtually unlimited authority under Athens' so-called democracy. War with Sparta erupted again in 432 and lasted until 404, when victorious Sparta abolished the democracy and installed an occupation government known as the Thirty Tyrants. Democracy was restored a year later, but in the 330s, the Macedonians, Philip and Alexander, took over Athens and the democracy was essentially destroyed. To put that in perspective, the Athenian democracy lasted about 170 years, roughly the same amount of time that California has been part of the United States. That does not count the various temporary interruptions of democratic rule. Of that 170 years, at least 114 were years of war. Little wonder that James Madison regarded the Athenian democracy as a failure. Democracies have always been spectacles of turbulence and contention, he wrote have always been found incompatible with personal security or the rights of property, and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. In other words, Greek history taught America's founding fathers what not to do. Three examples of the problems of Athenian democracy were particularly instructive to the American founding fathers. The first lay in the financial history of the Greek city-states. In case after case, the poor outnumbered the rich and fed their resentments into political action by supporting demagogues who promised that if they were given political power, they would, make, they would seize wealth from the rich and give it to the poor or would cancel all outstanding debts. Pisistratus, Nabus, and other dictators came to power in this way. The problem, of course, is that canceling debts destroys the possibility of credit because lenders will refuse to extend loans in the future. The poor then can't borrow the money that they need, and the engine of economic growth shuts down. On the other hand, if debts are treated like crimes, as they were in ancient Athens, borrowers will be pushed so severely that they will be essentially transformed into slaves. The greatest achievement of the Athenian lawgiver Solon, whom the Greeks regarded as among their wisest men, was to end this debt slavery system that reduced so many people to bondage. Could a way be found to prevent the majority from using political power to destroy the economic system out of envy or need? The attraction of the poor to our demagogues suggests the second reason that the American Founding Fathers regarded Greek democracy with such skepticism. The democratic susceptibility to popular heroes and agitators. Consider 
the career of the Athenian general Alcibiades. During the Peloponnesian War, he argued for the so-called Sicilian Expedition, an illegal attack which was advantageous to Athens's interests. The plan was controversial, but Alcibiades won the day and his fleet sailed for Sicily. But his political enemies found a way of trump trumping up false charges against him the instant he sailed, accusing him of defacing certain religious monuments in the city, so that in his absence they could put him on trial for blasphemy. They convicted him and sentenced him to death if he should ever return. So he chose to abandon Athens and joined its arch enemy Sparta. Without his leadership, the Athenian military was disastrously defeated in Sicily, resulting in the death or enslavement of some 10,000 men. But the Spartans, too, quarreled with Alcibiades, and again he defected, this time to the Persians. At last, when the members of the Athenian military plotted a coup against the city's anti-democratic leadership, they recalled Alcibiades to Athens again, and he led a series of Greek military attacks around the ancient world until at last returning to Athens in 407 BC. All of this took less than a decade. To the American founding fathers, Alcibiades' career symbolized the dangers of unlimited direct democracy. A strong man, handsome and brilliant, clothed in military glory, enjoying extraordinary skill and charisma, boundless ambitious and selfishness, he accumulates a worshipful audience as well as bitter enemies and comes to imagine himself above the law, leading to civil war. He seemed to foreshadow Julius Caesar and Napoleon Bonaparte. As Alexander Hamilton wrote, the people commonly intend the public good, but they do not always reason right about the means. In fact, it's a wonder that the majority does not go wrong more often than they do, given that the people are continually beset by parasites and sycophants, the ambitious, the avaricious, the desperate, by men who possess their confidence more than they deserve it. Sometimes good leaders must withstand the people's temporary delusions in order to give them time and opportunity for more cool and sedate reflection. Instances might be cited in which a conduct of this kind has saved the people from very fatal consequences of their own mistakes. Could the American founders create a system that would help the people to resist parasites, sycophants, and demagogues, and help the people to overcome the temporary delusions before they harmed themselves? This in turn suggests the third and most famous of the problems of Athenian democracy, its instability. The Athenians could celebrate Alcibiades one moment and sentence him to the death the next. In another infamous instance when the city of Mytilene rebelled against the Athenian rule, an Athenian general persuaded them to punish the Mytilenians by sending troops to kill all of the men and enslave all of the women and children. The next day, an opposing politician persuaded the people to change their minds, and the Athenians dispatched a ship to overtake the previous expedition and stop them. Fortunately, the second ship arrived in time to spare the Mytilenians. But once again, the Athenian democracy had proved itself too easily swayed, subject to all the reversals of policy. Athens, wrote John Adams in 1787, was never a place of sobriety, abstinence, and severity. Instead, from the first to the last moment of her democratical constitution, levity, gaiety, inconstancy, dissipation, intemperance, debauchery, and dissolution of manners were the prevailing character of the whole nation. By far the most notorious example of the weakness of the Athenian mob rule was the trial and execution of Socrates. Socrates was born in about 470 BC, and he worked as a stonecutter and as a soldier before he took up his famous philosophical inquiries. Now, this was at a time when Sparta was prevailing against Athens in the Peloponnesian War, and historian Bettany Hughes has argued that the war and other circumstances led to a populist reaction against avant-garde liberal intellectuals like Socrates, who had led the city into this disastrous war and despised the Athenian democracy. Certainly, Socrates' reputation cannot have been helped by the fact that he surrounded himself with people like Plato, whose hostility to democracy is well known, and Xenophon, who was so repelled by democracy that he moved to Sparta. His most notorious follower was, of all people, Alcibiades, with whom Socrates had served in the army and who felt for Socrates more than friendly attraction. When Athens' fortunes suffered in her war against Sparta, it would only have been natural for the people to turn their resentment against the city's lazy, philosophical, homoerotic intellectual elite, and particularly against their leader. In 423 BC, the playwright Aristophanes presented a comedy called The Clouds, which satirized Socrates as an airy philosopher who encourages sexual deviancy and teaches sons to rebel against their fathers. 
The play ends with the city's respectable citizens burning down Socrates' school and chasing him out of the city. It was 20 years before Athens was defeated in the war and Sparta installed the tyrants to rule over Athens. But when the 30 tyrants drew up a list of 3,000 Athenians whom they thought they could trust, Socrates was on that list. On the other hand, when they ordered Socrates to help them round up troublemaking Athenians, he refused. This gave reason for both the Spartans and the Athenians to distrust Socrates, who was then left without a protector. In 399 BC, he was charged with two crimes against the state, atheism and misleading the youths. He was convicted and sentenced to death, and Western civilization today regards him as a martyr to free speech, a martyr against democracy, not against monarchy or dictatorship, because it was the people of Athens, the voting majority, who put him to death. 2,000 years later, by the time of the American Revolution, Western intellectuals had reached a consensus that democracy was a foolhardy, futile, and dangerous form of government. The crucial political question was not who should hold political power, but how to impose a rule of law on society. If the majority is subject to no will but its own, then they are essentially above the law. They have the power, but they may not exercise that power rightly. What force, then, can make the people obey the law? Can the people make themselves make themselves obey the law? Or is that like the dieter who tries to hide the chocolate cake from himself? In 1776, most political philosophers believed that the people could not give law to themselves and that democratic rule would inevitably collapse into chaos, instability, and the various evils of Athenian history. We must not roll our eyes at this consensus or assume that previous generations were ignorant or prejudiced against democracy. These questions are still very much with us, a matter of life and death to millions in the Middle East today. Since September 11th, the United States and allied countries have struggled with the question of whether Islamic nations can thrive under democratic rule, or whether they are forever doomed to rule by one strong-armed dictator after another. For decades, American foreign policy was dominated by the conviction that the people of the Middle East cannot rule themselves, but must be ruled by autocrats friendly to Western interests, for example, the Shah of Iran. This type of foreign policy is typically called, he may be a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. These friendly dictators, however, typically maintain their rule through brutal crimes, often imprisoning and torturing dissenters, censoring the press, and taxing the people to support luxurious lifestyles. All of this stains American hands with blood, leading to still more hostility toward the democratic West and undermining the attitudes necessary for democracy. The situation becomes like the alcoholic who keeps putting off the day when he'll stop drinking, which only makes him more addicted. When in the 1970s American leaders became persuaded that the United States should not support cruel foreign dictatorships, they tried to kick the habit. But the Shah was replaced not by a friend of human rights, but by the Ayatollah Khomeini. That same cycle was then repeated 30 years later when the second Bush administration became persuaded that supporting foreign dictators was not, in fact, a pragmatic choice and that linking international policy to building free societies was more humane and, in the long run, more in our national interest. The administration initially met with success in replacing the dictatorship of Saddam Hussein, whom previous administrations had regarded as a useful son of a bitch, with democratic rule. But among the many missteps that followed, Western leaders continued to prioritize the majoritarian aspects of democracy over protections for individual rights. When given the opportunity to cast their votes, Middle Easterners overwhelmingly preferred some form of dictatorial or totalitarian rule instead of political freedom. And the result of the West's naive democracy first approach were such parodies of democracy as the triumph of Islamofascists in Egypt and Tunisia and the rise of ISIS. Today, prominent voices tout once more the benefits of political repression. How can we balance the rule of the majority with the need to keep the majority in check? How can the people make law for themselves and also follow it? To borrow a quintessentially Greek metaphor, can the people like Odysseus bind themselves to the mast so that they will not be tempted away from what they know is right? This question was particularly important to the English-speaking world at the time of the American Revolution because a century earlier, England had been torn by civil war and by a brief experiment by something approaching democracy. In 1649, the English executed their king and established a new written constitution under which parliament would govern. This experiment existed only for about four years before it collapsed into military dictatorship. 
which only lasted another six years before the English gave up and restored the monarchy. To Europeans, this proved once more that the people are incapable of ruling themselves and must be controlled by a strong, independent power. Montesquieu, the political thinker most admired by America's founding fathers, called the whole thing a very droll spectacle that proved that the people can only govern if they are virtuous. But virtue is a hard thing to maintain. When virtue is banished, ambition invades the minds of those who are disposed to receive it, and avarice possesses the whole community. The objects of their desires are changed. What they were fond of before has become indifferent. They were free while under the rule of laws, but they would fain now be free to act against the law. And as each citizen is like a slave who has run away from his master, that which was a maxim of equity is now called rigor. That which was a rule of action is now called constraint. And to precaution he gives the name of fear. The members of the commonwealth riot on the public spoils, and its strength is only the power of a few and the license of many. Note how this echoes the warnings of Polybius. Was there a way for the American founders to create a popular government which would also be lawful, in which the people would possess power, but would also be subject to the law? That was the question that faced James Madison and his colleagues when they sat down in Philadelphia in 1787 to write a constitution. In framing a government, Madison wrote, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. It was James Madison, more than any other thinker, who would fashion the United States' unique solution to this problem. Madison was born in Orange County, Virginia in 1751. Unusually for that time, he went to college in the north at what is now Princeton. He stayed on to study even after he graduated, becoming America's very first graduate student. He studied some law, but never became a lawyer. Instead, at the age of 23, he served on the Committee for Public Safety in his home county, the beginning of a career in public office that lasted until his retirement at the age of 66. Of his many political interests, his first and most fundamental was his belief in religious freedom. Religion, Madison believed, was a matter of purely individual conscience. If one person harmed another on the basis of religious belief, the state should intervene. But a person's private beliefs and religious practices are simply none of the government's business. It was among the rights no government, monarchical or democratic, could justly violate. The purpose of government is to protect individual freedom, not to empower the majority to do its will. Note how undemocratic this thinking is. For the Athenians, even for Socrates, the individual belonged to the city, and the city's rulers had the power to determine how the individual should be treated. While the laws of Athens were highly tolerant, Greek political philosophy had no fully formed concept of individualism. Remember that Socrates was executed in part because of his unorthodox religious views. According to the rules of pure Athenian democracy, there was nothing wrong about this. He himself did not regard it as unjust, and he made no reference to any individual right of freedom in his defense before the court. On the contrary, he refused the opportunity to save himself from death because he agreed that the laws were on the side of the prosecution. He viewed himself as owned by the laws of Athens. He called himself their child and servant. And he believed that for him to defy the majority's legal judgments would destroy the city. Athenians, like Socrates, were free, but they had no rights no moral or political principles that they could assert against the power of the city-state. By Madison's day, philosophers like John Locke had formulated the principle of individual rights and argued that government does not give us freedom by tolerating us, but instead that our rights come first and the state must respect and protect them. This change in thinking is clearest again in the case of religious freedom. At the time of the Revolution, British law accorded subjects broad religious toleration. Any Protestant sect that acknowledged the king's supremacy was free to practice its faith, although Catholics and non-Christians were excluded, and people of other faiths were still forced to support the Anglican Church through taxes. The British considered this as extremely liberal, and it was, relatively speaking. But for Madison and his allies, toleration was not enough. They insisted on religious liberty instead. In 1776, the Virginia legislature asked the respected 51-year-old statesman George Mason to prepare a Declaration of Rights. 
Madison, then half Mason's age, was new to the state legislature, but he was not too shy to object to part of Mason's draft. Madison later wrote that although he had been young and in the midst of distinguished and experienced members of the convention, he had suggested amendments, including the change to the terms in which the freedom of conscience was expressed. Where Mason had inadvertently adopted the word toleration, Madison urged the elder statesman to substitute a phraseology which declared the freedom of conscience to be a natural and absolute right. If religious freedom is a natural and absolute right, then it's not something that government may justly intrude upon, regardless of whether that government is a king or the people. Rule by the majority is only a means to protecting rights, not an end in itself. Democracy can be unjust, as it was in Socrates' case, because the majority should respect those rights like everyone else. In Madison's words, the sovereignty of the society as vested in and exercisable by the majority may do anything that could be rightfully done by the unanimous concurrence of the members. Madison himself emphasized that word rightfully because the reserved rights of individuals, of conscience for example, are beyond the legitimate reach of sovereignty. But of course the majority can be easily carried away by a common impulse of passion or interest and violate those rights. This is the problem of the tyranny of the majority. Wherever the real power of government lies, there is the danger of oppression, Madison wrote. In our governments, the real power lies in the majority of the community, and the invasion of private rights is chiefly to be apprehended, not from acts of government contrary to the sense of its constituents, but from acts in which the government is the mere instrument of the major number of its constituents. Consider again the three examples of Athenian misrule. The tendency of the poor majority to use political power to plunder the wealthy, the popularity of strongmen like Alcibiades, or demagogues who can sway the majority one direction one day and another the next, and the instability of the laws such that unpopular individuals like Socrates could be put to death unjustly. Madison diagnosed these problems in The Federalist. In a pure democracy, he wrote, groups of people motivated by a common passion or interest will often act in ways adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. Often, the majority of the people are themselves members of a faction, and there is nothing to check their inducements to sacrifice the weaker party or an obnoxious individual like Socrates. Government like this, in which the individual can never be sure what the majority might do to him, is even more dangerous than living with no government at all in a society under which the, forms, the, the stronger faction can readily unite and oppress the weaker, anarchy may truly be said to reign. Historically, the most common solution to this problem had been monarchy. Because kings are not elected and don't depend directly on the people for their power, they can act in ways the majority disapproves. So they can stop the people from persecuting an unpopular group or can insist on imposing some unpleasant but necessary rule that is in the people's interest but which they would not choose if left to their own devices. Like Middle Eastern dictators today, the king could keep the lid on the dangerous passions and irrational acts of different factions in society. But of course the king can also exploit that position for his own private interest and ignore the majority's will even when it should be obeyed. In absolute monarchies, wrote Madison, the prince may be tolerably neutral toward different classes of subjects but may sacrifice the happiness of all to his personal ambition or avarice. Aside from an absolute monarch, the only other solution philosophers had proposed for restraining the majority were prudence, respect for character, and religious scruples. All were helpful but not exactly reliable. Madison found a new solution, or at least a partial solution, and again it was inspired by his scholarship on religious freedom. The reason that Britain and America enjoyed relative religious freedom was because there were so many different religious groups vying for positions in society that they tended to cancel each other out. Their competition ensured that no one faction could seize political power and impose its will on the nation. In the same way, Madison argued, different social and economic groups might also be balanced against one another so as to prevent the government from falling into the hands of any one class of citizens. Divide and conquer, he wrote, is the only policy by which a republic can be administered on just principles. This was what the Constitution of 1787 set out to do. It includes democratic elements but subjects them to a rigid legal framework that limits and balances the majority's power in different ways. The House of Representatives would be elected directly by the people every two years, most democratic part of the Constitution. 
The Senate, by contrast, would be elected by state legislatures in a staggered fashion so that only a third of the Senate faces election at any one time, and the senators serve six years' terms, the longest term of any elected officials. The people would not choose the president, but neither would he be unelected. He would be chosen by electors, specially chosen for the purpose of picking a president. And the courts would be staffed by judges appointed for life by this indirectly elected president. Coming full circle to the democratic elements again, the financial system that gave life to this entire scheme would be primarily in the hands of the House of Representatives. In The Federalist, Madison set out to explain the system to ordinary Americans. The basic problem with democratic government, he said, is this problem of faction, the danger that private interest groups will use government power to impose their desires at the expense of their rivals. It is in vain to say that enlightened statesmen will be able to adjust these clashing interests, Madison wrote. Enlightened statesmen will not always be at the helm. There are two other solutions to the problem of faction. Destroy its causes or limit its consequences. Destroying the causes of faction, Madison rejects right out of hand. This is because the cause of faction is freedom itself. Liberty is to faction what air is to fire. It is freedom that leads some people to becoming richer than others, some people more successful than others, some greedier or crueler or better educated or more tolerant than others. Competing interest groups are therefore inevitable. And the only way to eliminate the causes of faction would be to destroy the freedom of speech, the right to assemble, the right to vote, and subject everybody to rigid control by the state to ensure that they're all the same. This, Madison says, would be as foolish as getting rid of air because it sometimes leads to fire. Life, too, depends on air. And abolishing liberty to destroy faction would be a remedy worse than the disease. This point is worth emphasizing because many of today's leading politicians urge proposals that they believe will stifle faction in just this way. Specifically, campaign finance laws, which each year impose heavier and heavier restrictions on political speech and on lobbying groups. This effort to stamp out faction by destroying liberty is just the path that the Constitution's authors chose not to take. Madison endorsed the second alternative instead, limiting the effects of faction. This can be done by creating a will in the community independent of the majority that can limit the majority's power. The Constitution does this in part by establishing an independent judiciary, which shall prevent the legislature from going beyond its constitutional limits. Such separation of powers is essential to the preservation of liberty. Another way to protect the people from the problem of faction is the limitation of powers. The government cannot abuse authority that it doesn't have in the first place. But the most important method is to render an unjust combination of a majority of the people very improbable, if not impracticable, by balancing different groups against one another. Here again, Madison used the analogy of religious freedom. In a free government, the security for civil rights must be the same as that for religious rights. It consists in the one case of the multiplicity of interests and in the other in the multiplicity of sects. This was a radical new idea in political science. The most admired political philosopher of the age, Montesquieu, had argued that democracy could only survive if the people were virtuous and therefore that a democratic government could only exist in a small geographical area where people could know one another. Madison was arguing the reverse. The larger a country could be better protected against the evils of democracy because its size would prevent the factional problems that caused so much trouble in Athens. The larger the society, he argued, the more duly capable it will be of self-government. The Constitution's authors therefore hoped that they had solved the problems that since the days of ancient Athens had plagued democratic rule. But the Constitution they were writing was not just for a single government, it was also supposed to bring together 13 state governments, each of which had its own political and social institutions. During the Revolution, the colonies had often had trouble putting their internal differences aside, and it was not until 1781 that they ratified the Articles of Confederation. It only took six years for Americans to realize that the Articles were not working, primarily because they left too much power in the individual state governments. To fix those problems, a new constitutional convention was scheduled for May 1787. Madison sat down with his books to prepare for the convention, and he wrote out a series of notes to guide his thinking. In one, he listed the vices of the political systems of the United States. In the other, he wrote out a list of notes on ancient and modern confederacies, beginning 
with three Greek confederacies, the Lycian Confederacy of 200 BC to 43 BC, the Amphictyonic League, which began at an unknown time. Madison thought about 1500 years BC and some, ended sometime in the second century AD. And the Achaean Confederacy, 280 BC to 146 BC. He also included more recent leagues and confederacies in his study, listing under each how their powers were divided between the states and the central government and the problems each had encountered. For example, he noted that under the Amphictyonic League, each Greek city sent two deputies to the central government and that the members of the League were bound by oath to defend each other and that the central government was responsible for deciding conflicts between the members, had the authority to enforce the decrees with the military power and so forth. But under vices, he noted, that the execution of these powers was very different from the theory. It did not restrain the parties from warring against each other. Athens and Sparta were members during their conflicts. This lack of real authority was why Greece had been unable to resist the invasion of Philip of Macedon. If Greeks' confederation had been stricter and had been better persevered in, he wrote, she would never have yielded to Macedon and might have proved a barrier to the vast projects of Rome. And these notes came in handy at the Constitutional Convention and later when he argued that Virginians should ratify the Constitution. For Madison and his supporters, the overwhelming concern of the Convention was to create something that would keep the Union of States together. God forbid the American states should fall into war against one another the way the cities of Greece or the nations of Europe had. True, American states shared a common religion and a common language, but as one of Madison's colleagues at the Constitutional Convention observed, the Greeks also had shared a common language, a common law, common usages and customs, and they had nevertheless destroyed every tie. How could the civil wars that marked European and ancient Greek history be avoided? In Madison's view, the primary reason that ancient Greek confederacies had failed was the weakness of the central authority. A weak government when not at war, he wrote, is ever actuated by internal dissensions, which never fail to bring on fresh calamities from abroad. In Federalist number 18, Madison used the notes that he had prepared on Greek history to make his point. The Persians had constantly exploited the rivalries between Sparta and Athens, and the Greek cities had been unable to discipline themselves well enough to present a united front against the Macedonians or against the Romans. If the American states quarreled with each other now, the French or the British or the Spanish, all of whom owned vast territory in North America, might see a similar opportunity to divide and conquer the New World. Americans needed to act now to prevent that disunion from happening. Consider one example of the ways in which the Articles of Confederation committed the same mistakes as the ancient Amphictyonic League. Under the Articles, the Congress had no power to implement its own orders. It could ask states to provide tax dollars or supply troops for the army, but it had no power to tax directly or raise its own armies, or enforce national laws if the states tried to resist. As Madison put it, the Articles of Confederation were derived from the dependent derivative authority of the legislatures of the states. It wasn't created by the people directly. And the same was true of the Amphictyonic League. Its powers were administered by deputies appointed wholly by the cities in their political capacities, Madison said. This meant that if the central government tried to pursue a policy that a city disliked, the city could jam up the works. And the only thing that the central government could do to enforce its decrees was to go to war against that city. The American Articles were already showing signs of the same problem. A single state could stymie national projects, even when such state rights enthusiasts as Thomas Jefferson were suggesting that Congress might use the military to force states to comply. The great and radical vice of the Articles, wrote Madison's friend Hamilton in The Federalist, was that it only allowed Congress to legislate for states or governments in their corporate or collective capacities, instead of allowing Congress to adopt laws that bound individuals directly. If a number of political societies enter into a larger political society, the laws which the latter may enact must necessarily be supreme over those societies and the individuals of whom they are composed. It would otherwise be a mere treaty and not a government. It was because the ancient Greek confederation lacked that supremacy that they had collapsed and the Greek city-states fell to bickering amongst themselves, making them ineffectual for the preservation of harmony and to pray for their own dissensions and foreign invasions.
This new constitution would avoid this mistake by replacing the treaty-style Articles of Confederation with a real constitution, one that would be the supreme law of the land, and which all state as well as national officers would be required to obey. In crucial respects, the federal government would be a single unit and not a league of sovereignties as in ancient Greece. So, the Greek experience taught Americans important lessons about the dangers of democratic politics, both internally and externally. Internally, the power of the majority had to be bound by the limits of law, a law that would divide the majority's power in ways that would still let the people control their government, but would prevent them from becoming a tyrannical majority. An elective despotism, said Jefferson, was not the government we fought for. Instead, the revolutionary generation hoped to create a government which should not only be founded upon just principles, but in which the powers of government should be so divided and balanced that none could transcend their legal limits without being effectually checked and restrained. Externally, Greek history taught the need for a strong central government that would prevent the states from flying off in their own directions. Governments destitute of energy will ever produce anarchy, Madison told his fellow Virginians when urging them to ratify the Constitution. He did not mean by this what we mean when we speak of big government today. Madison believed in a government that did a few things well, rather than one that does a lot badly. The states should retain most day-to-day -day government power, but on matters that concern the American nation, the federal government should have the power to make national policy and make it stick. These two lessons actually relate in an important way. The founders hoped that strong central government would not only enable the United States to resist foreign attack and avoid conflict with each other, but that it would also protect citizens against tyranny at the hands of their own states. At the top of Madison's priorities when he went to the Constitutional Convention was a federal power to veto state laws, especially laws that violated his favorite individual right, religious liberty. This was the worst defeat of Madison's career. And for a while, he considered his work in Philadelphia a failure because he didn't get it. Later, he tried to get the proposal added to the Bill of Rights, and he again failed. It wasn't until 1868, with the passage of the 14th Amendment, that this omission would be corrected. Still, the Constitution restricted the states in important ways that did help, although imperfectly, to restrain the worst excesses of local democracy. By dividing power between the states and the federal government, the Constitution created a compound republic in which power is first divided between two distinct governments, state and federal, and then the portion allotted to each subdivided among distinct and separate governments, as the Federalist puts it. This would give a double security to the rights of the people. The different governments will control each other, and at the same time, each will be controlled by itself. The creation of the United States of America was the work of a great many minds, but of the founding political thinkers, James Madison was the most ingenious. Jefferson was a brilliant abstract theorist. John Adams was a marvelously practical man. But it was Madison, more than any other, who combined the highest abstractions of political theory with the practical skills of a political leader. He was an engineer who helped design a machine to give real effect to the high ideals of the revolution. History was his indispensable guide in that effort. Experience, he wrote, is the oracle of truth. The experience of the Greeks, and particularly of Athens, taught important lessons, lessons about the failures of previous democracies, lessons about what not to do if the new nation was to prove true to the principles of freedom on which it was based.